We're going to step through each of the components of the lifecycle one by one now, starting with the model formulation and data collection. So one key principle that we want to adhere to when it comes to model formulation is what is called human-centered design, which states that AI systems and machine learning solutions should consider impact that they have on humans. So what do we want to consider? Well, we want to be aware of any potential harms. So will the use of machine learning technology be beneficial for the use case? Might it end up reinforcing existing stereotypes or amplify bias? And also, what is the value proposition? So is AI, is machine learning really necessary? Or can a simple, interpretable, rule-based system achieve the same result? So what we want to do is we want to ensure that there are safety measures, which means we need to continuously test and evaluate the system, and that there also exist ways to challenge the model and the machine learning pipeline itself. So we should include ways for users to report unexpected behavior. Or if they do see results that they don't expect, there should be a feedback mechanism in place for them to flag that behavior and those issues that they observe. So obviously this is just a very, very short introduction to human-centered design, so I would highly encourage you to have a look at additional materials online. So if you just look for human-centered design online, you will find quite a long checklist and content out there as well. Just to give you a quick illustration of some of the areas of focus in human-centered design, or spe more specifically human-centered AI, so human-centered AI systems are designed to work with and for people. And the areas to focus on to advance human-centered AI is the development of tools, processes, and practices that help scope and facilitate human-machine teaming. So really finding ways for humans to collaborate with machine learning systems and solutions. And then designers and systems must also understand the context of use and sense the changes over time. So as I mentioned earlier, the world around us does evolve, does change over time. So we do need to actually include that in the design process as well. And finally, the model and the system itself should be built in a way that can help engage and enable critical oversight. So there should be a feedback mechanism in place and a way to challenge the outputs. Moving on to the data collection stage now. So this actually brings us to one of the potential sources of bias in the machine learning solution. We can actually see that there are multiple potential sources of bias, but the first one really comes from the data set itself. So the key ingredients, the key components of the machine learning model are on one side the data set, we've seen this earlier, and then also the algorithm. So obviously each of these key ingredients can also become a source for potentially biased results. So as we know, machine learning models to learn from the data that is provided as an input to them. So if we have bad quality or biased data as an input, well then the model may end up producing poor or biased results as an output. And we will have a look at different bias mitigation techniques that can help us reduce this unwanted bias. And where does the bias come from? Well, here we have a couple of examples. So models may produce biased results if we have either skewed examples, tainted examples, a limited number of features, so not enough information, or different sample sizes for different groups, or proxy variables in our data. So on a high level, how can we reduce bias? Well, we can reduce bias and mitigate bias by ensuring data integrity. So that means we need to select meaningful high quality features. So this is going to be about the quality of the features themselves. We need to use valid, fair sampling and storage techniques. So this is going to be about feature sampling itself. And then we might want to double check the labels or the creation process, the annotation of the labels themselves. Because a lot of the bias that we find is actually historical or coming from sources where there is already a lot of bias inherent. So if we just use that data in a supervised setting, the model 
will amplify or likely amplify the bias that already exists in the data itself. On the previous slide, we just said that we want to ensure data integrity. And one of the ways to do that is by making sure that we have features of the highest quality possible. But what does it really mean for a feature to be high quality? Well, it means that the feature should be robust and objective, saying that it should not depend on who is recording the information and it should also be reproducible. A couple of characteristics then about such high quality features. Number one is that the features should be quantifiable. So they should be true measurements of a certain characteristics, such as the number of messages between peers versus using something subjective like a connectedness score. A subjective score like connectedness that might depend on who's recording it or maybe even the mood of the day. So wherever you can use direct measurements that are also quantifiable. So this is the second point then on direct measurements. So avoid using outputs that come from another model or an unknown source because this might hide bias or proxy variables. And then thirdly, the features should also be understandable, meaning that the feature name or metadata that we provide should actually describe what the feature is all about. So if you have a naming example here of monthly underscore bonus, well, that's much easier to understand than using MB. The next topic that I want to talk about is feature sampling or the sampling bias that can occur. And this is a bit of a warning to beware of biased sampling, meaning sampling methods that systematically over or underrepresent certain groups. And you might be wondering now, well, where does this bias in the sampling technique come from? Well, there are many potential sources, the first one being selection bias. So if you were to go out and you want to record health information about different individuals and you start sampling in front of a high school, well, then you're going to get a certain age range and potentially a lot of healthy health records. If you were to repeat the same sampling in front of a hospital, well then the age range would be very different and very likely the health records would also look very different. So it really depends on where you sample, who you sample, what the groups are that represent the data. So careful when it comes to selecting the sample itself. Secondly, you can suffer from what is called a measurement bias. So if you have different devices that take the measurements, they might end up producing different results. So again here, very careful if you want to record in two different regions, those two regions should also have access to the same measurement device or same measurement method. Thirdly, and this is more related to data from the wild or data that's already been recorded and is already out there, and that is the historical bias. So we know that society itself can indeed be biased. So any data that we scrape from the wild or that we just take without doing our own sampling, we might not know what the selection here was. And we can also exhibit what is called the historical bias. And the final example that I have here is confirmation bias where you are wrongly discarding outliers to match existing beliefs. So this is something that can occur quite easily where you're looking at your data, you've recorded your samples, and then you find that a few data points indeed look very different to the rest. You might think, oh, this is an outlier. I should go ahead and remove the outlier. But careful here. The outlier could actually be a minority group because there are a lot of shared characteristics here where minorities, you would usually have fewer examples of those in your data set by the nature of them being a minority. That's what makes them a minority. So if you were to just discard the data points that look different to the rest and where there's few examples, you might actually be wrongly discarding some minority groups. These are just a few examples that are more sources of potential bias and careful when it comes to selecting your samples, the measurement devices that you're using, the historical information that you might have, and also the confirmation bias. And just to illustrate this a bit more, we have an example of a language and an image data set here. In the center, you have a bar chart that shows the different distribution of geographical regions for a very popular image data set. And what you can see 
quite clearly is that the United States, Great Britain and Canada make up the majority of the data set. So if you were to then train an image classifier on this data set, well then very likely it would perform better on images or objects that are typically found in the US, UK or Canada. So geographical representation is very important indeed. And a similar story for the language data sets, where nowadays a lot of the language data is scraped from online sources such as Wikipedia or Reddit or any other online books. And depending on where you take the data from, you might not get a good representation of different subpopulations. And then the paper that you have here is Man is to Computer Programmer as Woman to Homemaker, which was a very famous paper that was actually uncovering some of that bias that's hidden in those data sets. Another thing to consider when it comes to sampling is actually the sample size itself. So I already mentioned that by definition, a minority is a group with fewer examples. And machine learning models, they generally improve the performance or their performance the more examples that they see. So that means that if you have two different populations in your data set and for one of them you have a very large number of samples, well then very likely the model will perform better for that particular group and perform worse for the minority group. So carefully sample all groups and there are different techniques and things that you can do, such as upsampling for the minority group or downsampling the majority group. And that can really help balance out the data set. There are also techniques and methods that you can use directly when it comes to model training by basically letting the model know what the different ratios and different group sizes are. And that can also help mitigate some of the bias. So we know that labels are a sort of special kind of feature in our data set, where the label, again, as a reminder, is the thing that we want to predict. And having high label quality is crucial for us. There are two examples here of labels gone wrong. The first one being what is called tainted labels. So labels, they generally describe what happened historically, but not what the outcome should have been. So if we just take the labels as they are, there might in fact be a representation of historical or societal bias that has already occurred in the past. So this does not give us, or labels generally do not give us what should have been the fair outcome. And secondly, we can also have label quality issues with what are called imprecise labels, where labels can be insufficiently precise to capture meaningful differences between cases. So it might be that you have different categories, but actually the decision between the two different categories was a very close hit or miss, and the labels don't actually differentiate with enough detail or precision to really have a clear distinction. What is A, what is B, or even if we look at numerical labels, there could be two values that are very close to one another. So what can we do in those cases? Well, in the case of tainted labels, we need to really find a measure or a way to address the underlying cause of inequality. So we might need to use bias transforming metrics and we'll see what those are later on. When it comes to imprecise labels, we might want to collect additional information or clean the labels manually before passing them to the machine learning model to train. As a general note on data sets, so it's a best practice and generally advisable to collect all the information that you have about the data that's being used to train the model in what is called a data sheet. So the data sheet is basically a record of the main characteristics of the data and the use case and limitations of what you're planning on doing. And example questions or things that you might want to record in such a data sheet is who collected the data, what purpose was the data collected for, when and where was the data collected. So this gives information about the recency and relevance of the data. How was it collected? What are the measurement devices that were used? And we can also provide descriptive statistics of the data set, like how many data points are there and 
more specific on the dates, how many columns, how many features, over what time period was the data collected. So everything that could be relevant to have access to later on if you're coming back and you're wondering where did that data come from? Are there any potential sources of bias in the data set itself? You can record all of that information in a data sheet and that will preserve the information for the next person down the line or even if you yourself need to come back to the data set to make some modifications or maybe add additional data, well then you'll have all the basics of what's in your data already recorded in the data sheet.